When addressing the question of women pastors, the verses 1 Timothy 2.12 through 14 are always front and center. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Objections from this verse will include questions such as, why would anyone claim that women should not be pastors, especially if women were given that spiritual gift? And why? Can women not be teachers when Euodia and Syndike labored together in the gospel? These are important questions that must have an answer. Otherwise, maybe women should be pastors. This video will have many points given, so make sure to keep up. Luckily for us, the Bible is very clear to all of those questions. Firstly, it's irrelevant if a woman should be a pastor on the basis of spiritual gifts, given the verses we have to deny women pastorship. If we start at the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, we will see that from the very beginning, God gave women a specific role. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. One of the first sins in the garden was the woman having a sinful dominion over the man to give him the fruit. God had originally made the woman as a helper for the man, but she was deceived. Now, this is not to say that there are women not intelligent enough to be a pastor, or that women are in any sense less valuable than men. But it is to say that since the start of the Bible, we see clear gender roles. The second common question for those defending women pastors is why Yodia and Syndike are allowed to labor together in the gospel, but women cannot be pastors. The verse that this argument comes from is Philippians 4, 2 through 3. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syndike to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel alongside with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. To put it simply, the gospel is the proclamation of Jesus' death for sins, burial, and resurrection, something that the Bible is very clear that all people are to proclaim. Something interesting about this argument is the assumption that the Bible actually talks about women as pastors. There are no women pastors in the Bible, and an interesting note to take for those trying to justify women pastorship is that all Jesus' disciples were men, and all the books of the Bible were written by men also. Again, this has nothing to do with pride, but it has to go with our specific gender roles God has given us. Prophetesses are, however, mentioned in the Bible, but not once is a prophetess seen teaching or usurping authority over a man in the gathered body of believers. In fact, the Bible explains how women leading a nation can be detrimental. Isaiah 3.12 says, My people, infants are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, your guides mislead you, and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. In the same way, a woman leading the church, even with a male elder board, would be detrimental to the church. Now, if by this point in the video you're not convinced, it might have to do with how you interpret the Bible. A view that's made its way into culture is postmodernism, and Christians that are my age more commonly have the idea that if we cannot interpret a Bible verse easily, then can be whatever it means to the hearer. An example of this is when people say it's my truth or it's your truth or anybody can believe what they want in their heart and it's true for them. But there's a huge problem with this. If I were to say I interpret the Bible verse that says all liars have their part in the lake of fire to mean if I tell five lies a day, then I'm going to make it to heaven. It has to be It has to be six. Well, then that's not what God intended for it to mean. And what God intends for us to mean is more important than what I want it to mean. Another interpretation issue is one that says Paul speaks of women pastors in a way that is only cultural. If we're able to throw out this verse because it's cultural, we might as well throw out all other verses because they're cultural that have moral reasons also, if you recall, in verse 13 of 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says a moral reason, not a cultural reason, for why women can't be pastors. That Adam was formed first, then Eve. Then, 14 says that Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. The rest of the story goes that Eve then gave the fruit to Adam and he ate the fruit as he was our federal head. Now here's an analogy that might help you understand the implications of what Adam actually did when he ate 
that fruit. If my country goes to war, I may have no choice whether or not I fight in it. In the same way, when our federal head, Adam, sinned, we are appointed to die, and after this, the judgment. Anyone who believes that they are good enough to go to heaven by their own goodness is mistaken, since Jesus himself said, there is no one good but God. In fact, our sin is so serious that the Bible says that all liars have their part in the lake of fire. I don't know about you guys, but I've, I've told lies, and so... Is there any hope for me, or you, or anyone in the world even? Well, I wouldn't be telling you this message if there wasn't hope. Jesus said he is the only way to the Father, he is the only one way we can be saved, and the Lord Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Now how can this have anything to do at all with us and our depraved state that we can't do anything without him. Well, when he died on the cross, he said it is finished, which meant that our debt is paid, that we could roam free and go free out of the place that we were held, which was bondage. If that doesn't make sense, here's an analogy that might help you. If I'm in court and I have speeding fines and someone else pays them for me, I can be free to go. Now, if I tried to tell the judge to get out of my speeding fines that I was a good person, or maybe that I just wanted to be forgiven, that probably wouldn't work if that were a just judge. And in the same way, God, who is a righteous judge, as the Bible says in Psalm 711, couldn't let us go free, but what Jesus did is he made it possible. The message of the Bible is then to repent and believe the gospel. As you put your faith in Jesus, you will let go of your sin and trust in him instead of your good works to save you on judgment day. I hope this video has been a blessing to you all. Please continue fervently praying for this channel that will be used for the glory of God. Watch this video where Jeremy has a lovely conversation with a kind woman who is trusting in baptism to save her. And have a God-blessed day.